L'inférence non paramétrique pour les modèles de mélange, dans son département, il y a des personnes célèbres comme Bruce Lindsay qui ont travaillé sur des sujets de cette nature. Alors David a travaillé sur de, de nombreux sujets, notamment la modélisation de réseaux sociaux, algorithmes et même, mais aujourd'hui, il va nous parler d'estimation non paramétrique de modèles de mélange par une approche EM régularisée. David Merci. Et d'abord, il me faut remercier les organisateurs pour avoir m'invité. Et c'est vraiment toujours un plaisir de visiter en France et c'est un, un, un honneur d'être là. Il faut dire que je ne, je ne peux pas parler en français pendant cette exposition, donc euh, je vais changer mon, ma langue euh, bientôt. Mais euh, je comprends bien le problème euh, d'une langue qui est par parlée avec une vitesse terrible. Donc euh, si vous avez des questions ou, ou si je, euh, je parle trop vite, euh, s'il vous plaît, euh, m'arrêtez. Donc euh, le, le changement de la langue euh, commence right now. Yeah, so there are, there are a lot of people that, that I, I've worked with on this, uh, this research, and uh, some of you actually may have seen some of the slides that are, are going to be appearing in front of you very shortly. And if so, I apologize, but uh, I, I think that this, this entire topic is something that's not very well known, and so I thought it was probably a good idea to spend some time talking right from the beginning about what this is about. Uh, so, oh, let me just point out, there's a, you know, a couple people on this list who are sitting in this very room. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to work with them. This is actually the excuse that I used to spend a sabbatical year in France in, at the University of Orléans a couple of years ago, and that was just absolutely fantastic. So, Like I said, I wanted to talk a little bit about just what non-parametric mixtures mean, at least in the context of this talk, because non-parametric mixtures is a sort of an ambiguous term. I have a colleague at Penn State who does work on non-parametric mixtures in a slightly different sense. So I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by non-parametric mixtures. I'll also talk a little bit about the very important problem of identifiability. I, I'm not sure it's possible to even talk about these models without addressing identifiability. So I'll get into that a little bit. And, and then the second part of the talk, I, I'll spend the first part of the talk in a simple case of univariate mixture models, then extend this to the multivariate case. And there's actually a very important difference between the univariate case and the multivariate case, and I'll explain that, it has to do with identifiability, this very important problem. And then the, the title of the talk is actually the third part of the talk, so we'll see how, how far I'm able to get. That's something, I'll, well, it's not that important. All right, so this is what we mean by a mixture model. In general, we might suppose that we have a random variable x that comes from a density g, and g is a mixture. Okay, it's, it, there's, there are two parts to the mixture. We have a, a component density, and we have a mixing distribution. And so when I'm talking about non-parametric mixtures today, what I'm going to be talking about is non-specified F. But that's not always what non-parametric mixtures means, and I just want to make that absolutely clear. Sometimes the Q is the part that's non-specified. And so, so sometimes non-parametric mixtures refers to a family, a parametric family F, but a completely unspecified mixing distribution. That's not what I'm doing at all, right? So, so I will here assume that F is mostly unrestricted. That's the non-parametric sense of this talk. Whereas Q is assumed to have finite support. Not only that, but I'm going to make the incredibly strong assumption, maybe unwarranted assumption in most cases, that we not only know that Q has finite support, but we know how many points it's supported on. Right? So, so this is your standard finite mixture model with, with M components, and I'm going to assume throughout that M is known. And the, the great question is always, how do you choose M? The answer is, I'm not going to talk about that in this talk. There, I have not yet seen a good answer to that question. 
Uh, so if you know of one, please let me know. There's, there have been many things proposed in the literature, and, and yet somehow they don't seem to work as well as things that aren't really supposed to work for this case, like BIC. Uh, somehow BIC seems to work as well as anything, and it's not even really built for this job. So this is a, a hard question. So we'll just assume away that question, and we will we'll take M as known throughout the talk. All right, so, so this is now the, the mixture model that we're interested in. This is the density from which the observations will be drawn. So let's just look at a picture where mixtures might be useful. I love this picture because it was taken at my university. This, was, this is Penn State University in 1975. Uh, this, is, this is the main building on the campus of my university. I was not, well, I was not there yet. I was still in kindergarten at that time. But what you have here is a living histogram, right? So these, these are students at Penn State in 1975 lined up according to their heights. And I like to use human height as the typical example of a mixture model when I'm explaining to non-statisticians what mixture models do. I say, well, you're given a list of heights and you're asked to find out about the male and female subpopulations without any information about which sex each person is, right? You don't observe the sex. All you observe is a list of heights. And so I think it's worth thinking about what it is that we do when we fit a mixture model. Partly this is because mixture models tend to get mixed up, no pun intended, with clustering. Uh, mixture models are often described as model-based clustering. And so I think that when you're talking about individuals and trying to group individuals into clusters, you sometimes lose sight of the fact that really there's modeling going on, and one of the main things we might be interested in is learning about these populations. In other words, learning about the parameters. On the other hand, if you really do want to do clustering, then mixture models are pretty good Right? In fact, in a certain sense, they're better than clustering because they give you a fuzzy solution. They don't tell you for certain which cluster a person should lie in. And of course, you can't do that in general. You can't give me the height of an individual and expect me to classify that individual as a male or female. That simply doesn't work. So we have to be a little bit careful, careful about what the goal is in doing mixture modeling, and in particular, make sure that if we're using mixtures for clustering, we have a clear sense of, of what we're doing. So I'm not going to use the height example. I'm going to use a similar example to, to illustrate the non-parametric mixture model techniques. This is uh, where you might have seen some of these slides in the past. So, so what we're looking at here is a histogram of the time between eruptions for a geyser in Wyoming State. This is, this is northwestern Wyoming in the United States in a place called Yellowstone Park, which is a fantastic park. If you ever are visiting the west of the United States and, and have the chance to go to Yellowstone National Park, it's absolutely fantastic, and you might see Old Faithful yourself. And, and so these are numbers of minutes between eruptions of this geyser. And there's some obvious bimodality here. And even though it might not be that scientifically interesting, we could imagine trying to fit a mixture model with two components to this particular data set. And so this is the two-component mixture density that we imagine gave rise to these data. Right? So if I'm here to talk about non-parametric mixture models, and I don't want to put assumptions on F, then it seems like that's what I ought to do, not put any assumptions. Well, that doesn't work. We, we need some assumptions on the FJ, and in case that's not completely obvious, I tried to throw together a quick illustration of, of why you need some sort of assumption about the Fs. Right? There is no way that you can uniquely identify the parameters. Now, I'm going to go back a slide. The parameters now are the lambdas, the, the weights, and also these densities, F1 and F2, which are completely unspecified, or at least partially unspecified. If we have no assumptions at all, then we simply can't do it, right? There's no way that the black density uniquely identifies the green and the red. It just doesn't work. 
So we need some sort of constraints in order to have a statistical framework at all. It's a very important thing to deal with when you're doing these non-parametric mixture models. And by the way, sometimes uh, there, was, there was an interesting talk the other day. Um, the, the, sometimes you can search for modes in the data. Sometimes you can actually use clustering as a guide. But sometimes there isn't any obvious multimodality. In this particular case, you kind of say, well, yeah, there's two bumps. And so that might guide my choice of the F and the lambda. But in general, this is not true. You might not observe uh, multimodality at all. So you might use um, covariates information if that's, if that's available to you, the way it was in Monday's talk. All right, so what sorts of assumptions might one make about the density functions F? We want to stay as non-parametric as possible while still allowing unique identifiability of the parameters in the model. So, well, this is, this is the mixture model. It turns out that one thing that you can do, one possible set of assumptions looks like this. We will say that the JF component is actually a location shift of some symmetric density F that is otherwise completely unspecified. Right? So it's, it's still a pretty non-parametric problem, not completely unspecified, but we're putting pretty weak assumptions on this F. Uh, this F is just supposed to be symmetric, and the FJ is supposed to be a shifted version for every J. If you make this assumption, it turns out that identifiability of the parameters is provable, at least in the case when you don't have uh, lambda 1 and lambda 2 equal to 1 half. And you can concoct an algorithm to do the fitting. Okay, the algorithm, or algorithms, that I will discuss today are based on EM algorithms. And if you've never seen EM algorithms, this is just a quick slide to orient you to EM algorithms in the, in the setting of finite mixture models. And so for EM, we have a... a complete and observed data set somehow, right? And, and the complete data set in the case of finite mixtures is not only the x's that are observed, but also these indicator functions z, where z is the indicator of whether or not x comes from the component you're interested in, right? So z is actually a vector. It's a vector of one, one, and all the rest zeros. What this means, if you've never seen this before, is that you can generate data from a finite mixture model as follows. The first thing you do is you select your z at random. z is multinomially distributed. And then conditional on z, you can pick your x from the correct density function. Right? And, and we're not going to worry too much about whether z has a real meaning. Uh, sometimes z is actually scientifically interesting. In the application I'll talk about pretty soon, there's really a belief that there are different groups of people, distinct groups of individuals. And in that sense, the z is interpretable. Sometimes, however, mixture models are simply used because they give more flexibility in modeling, in which case the interpretation of z is a little bit fuzzier. But we're not going to worry too much about that. So this is an EM algorithm. This is the sketch of how an EM algorithm works in the finite mixture model case. And the EM algorithm is called EM because there's an E step, which stands for expectation, and an M step, which stands for maximization. And the E step is actually finding this expectation right here, which really amounts to the following ratio. And if you look at this ratio, it's really just the a posteriori uh, expectation that the ith observation comes from the jth component. Right? So, so based on the current parameter values theta hat, I want to know what's the probability that the ith observation comes from the jth component. That's what this z hat will indicate. We now take the z hats and put them into what's called the complete data log likelihood. Uh, this is not always the way EM algorithms work, by the way. It just happens that in the mixture model case, everything is beautiful. And so all we have to do is throw the z hats into the, the log likelihood. And in any case, the next 
iteration of the lambdas will always be the average of the z vectors. Remember, z is a vector, right? It's the z hats, I should say. The z hats are calculated up here. You take their average and you get a vector of lambdas. That's the next iteration in any finite mixture model EM algorithm. And so what we're going to do is use this same framework uh, plus an additional step. Right? I don't think I need to say anything about that. Okay. So what we're adding is this kernel density estimation step. That KDE stands, I should have written that out. Yes, okay, kernel density estimate. KDE stands for kernel density estimate. And so in, inside this EM algorithm, that is just what I showed you on the previous slide, we're now going to update this parameter FJ. Remember, FJ is now a parameter. It's a non-parametrically specified density function. So what are we going to do about that? Well, the obvious answer, if you're just trying to estimate a density, is some sort of kernel density estimator, right? So that's the, the, the naive approach that, that we took, and so it seems to work out pretty well. Uh, in fact, this is, this is now uh, quite old, so this is, this is due to two people sitting in this room, uh, along with Pierre. Uh, and, and their idea was as follows. Well, we have these Z hats. What we can simply do is select for each I a random multinomial variable. And in so doing, we can classify temporarily each observation to one of the components based on the current version of the probabilities of being in those components. And after you've done that assignment, then you can simply do a kernel density estimator on each of the components separately. Okay? So that's, that's the idea of the, the, the 2007 paper. Alternatively, you can use this in a non-stochastic fashion. You simply do a weighted kernel density estimate where the weights are given by the z-hats. Right? It, it amounts to the same thing, um, but this one is stochastic and, and this one is not. So if you're doing this for the case of the old faithful data, you believe that the F here, uh, or down here, has to be symmetric. Here's your kernel density estimator. You can symmetrize this. Uh, so, so there's nothing really that interesting here, except for one little bit, which is right here. This is sort of interesting. Part of the M step is to update the parameter mu. right? The, the, the mu parameters, I should say, are the centers of the uh, the densities. And, and how do we do that? This is, this is just taking a weighted mean, as you can tell, right? But the, there's nothing in the algorithm that suggests what we ought to do here. So I guess you have some choices. You could actually take sort of a weighted median, if you prefer. Um, you could try to do something with, with, that actually just uses the F hats. In, but at any rate, this, this step right here is a little bit, I don't know, unspecified. You, you have some flexibility in choosing that. All right, so when we do this for these data, this is just a typical mixture of normals fit, assuming equal variances between the two components. And if you throw in this, this semi-parametric uh, algorithm, then you get something that looks very similar. And that's, that's kind of nice because it gives you some confirmation that the original normal distribution assumption was maybe reasonable, right? And if you're curious to try this out, there's a package called Mixed Tools in which all of this stuff that I'm talking about today is implemented. All right, so, so that's kind of the, the background story. Um, identifiability is very important. Okay? You, you just can't do anything in this realm without worrying about whether you can uniquely identify the parameters that you're trying to estimate. So what we're going to do is talk about a multivariate example. And again, if you've seen, you may have seen this slide before, if you've ever heard me talk about this. Uh, this is a fantastic experiment that was done by a colleague at Penn State, Hoban Thomas, who is a psychologist. What they did was they showed this picture to a bunch of people, more than 400 people in our data set. And not just this picture, but also, so this is, this is a, a, you can think of this as some sort of a vessel that contains liquid. And it's pointing toward one o'clock on the clock, right? They also showed the subjects all of the other clock orientations, except for the, the, horizontal, or the horizontal and the vertical ones, right? So no 12 o'clock, no 6 o'clock, no 9 and 3. But all, all the other eight orientations are shown to an individual. And the question being asked is, where is the surface of the water? 
right? So if you put water into this vessel, draw for me the surface of the water. Is it going to look like this? Is it going to look like this? And, and they actually take a pencil and physically draw on the piece of paper what the surface of the water will look like. And then what's measured is the angle that's formed with the horizontal, okay? Now, I hope everybody in the room knows <laughs> that the correct answer should be zero degrees, right? So, so if you understand the way water actually works, and you know, you're, at, you're sitting on, let's say, a planet say, like Earth, then, then the water should, should be like this. And, and so the question is, well, how well do people understand this concept? Right? So we, what we're having here is repeated measurements. Right? Each individual gets eight chances at similar types of questions. And we're interested in what their responses look like. So this is an inherently multivariate task that we're asking. I shouldn't say we, that, that Hoban Thomas and his colleagues asked. All right, so this is what the data look like. Uh, and again, if you're, if you're interested to see these data, you can actually get them from the mixed tools package in R. Uh, it's just called water data. There are 405 subjects. I'm going to just introduce a little bit of notation here. R is the dimension in a lot of the slides that you'll see, right? So we have eight measurements per individual. So these are eight dimensional observations. And this question here, of course, is very interesting. And I, I promised I was not going to talk about it. Well, well, we'll just look at a couple of instances. We'll look at m equals 3 and m equals 4 because they're kind of interesting stories to tell. But the main thing I want to get at is um, ju just what happens in the multivariate case that didn't happen in the univariate case. Right. So what we're going to assume is the following. And this is a very important assumption. We're going to assume that each of the FJs, which, again, were completely unspecified. Well, not quite. They're not quite completely unspecified, right? We are going to specify that each of these FJs is the product of its marginals, right? So, so this thing here, this is FJ. And so this is the mixture density, right? G of X is just like before. This is the mixture density. And of course, X is now a vector. It's in boldface. XK is the kth coordinate of X, right? So, so this is the density that we are assuming. And it turns out that this assumption is fairly strong. In fact, it's strong enough to guarantee identifiability of the parameters, which is really interesting. But we'll get to that in a second. Uh, first of all, it's, it's, we, we have actually had at least one experience of submitting a, an article and, and being questioned very strongly about this assumption and, and why it, it is at all useful, why is it at all realistic, and if you're assuming conditional independence, then it's not really a multivariate problem anymore. Um, that's not true. The dependence is still there, and of course these data are dependent, right? Of, of course we know that, that the data should be dependent. These eight-dimensional observations exhibit dependence, but the dependence is through the mixture structure. And if you, if you want to sort of think about the way that might work, think about a, a, just a standard repeated measures model, right? A, a s traditional assumption, a standard assumption, is that in repeated measures, conditional on the individual, right? There's an, an individual effect, but conditional on which individual you are, the observations are independent. I mean, that's a fairly standard assumption. That's not saying, of course, that the... In the observations are marginally independent, right? There's a huge degree of dependence, but the dependence is completely specified by the individual level effect. Well, in this case, we don't have an individual level effect. We have component level effects, right? So it's a slightly weaker version of a repeated measures model, where you assume that given the component of the mixture in which you were found, now your observations are independent. And that's a totally reasonable assumption. Yes, it's a strong assumption, but it's a totally reasonable and, and sort of traditional assumption to make in statistics. And it's beautiful that this actually works out. Um, there's also kind of a, a literature about this going back. In fact, uh, Chin and Lung, uh, in their paper, claim that, that this goes back even into the 90s. But most of the folks who work in this small region of statistics land uh, point to the, the paper by Peter Hall and his co-author Zhou back in 2003. This is in the Annals of Statistics. And, and they uh, dealt with this problem specifically, the problem of identifiability of parameters in a conditional independence mixture model. Okay. So this is, this is the beautiful result due to uh, Alman Matthias and Rhodes. This is Katrin Matthias, in case you know her. This is 2009 in the annals. They 
dug up an old result by Kruskal back from the 70s and used that result to prove a very elegant result, which is that as long as these are linearly independent, and of course they have to be linearly independent in order to have any hope of identifiability, right? So, so this, this may seem like it's some sort of a, an assumption, but it's really not. There, you, you have to have this, obviously, if you think about it for a minute. So as long as you have linearly independent density functions, in other words, one of them can't be expressed in a non-trivial way as a, as a linear combination of the others, and you have at least three dimensions, then you have identifiability of parameters. That's phenomenal. And, and, and I just want to give you an idea of how hard this problem was. Right? Between 2003, the Holland Zoe paper, uh, who, who tried to, to start on this path, there were three or four papers that got increasingly complex that made you know, very small conjectures about certain cases. And, and then along comes this paper, and it's, oh, it's very simple. As long as you have three dimensions, it's done. And that's great because it means that if we're using the assumption of conditional independence, we can just use the algorithm that I specified earlier, and we know that we're doing something sensible. And that's terrific. Right, so, um, oh, this is kind of ugly. Um, yeah, let me just skip, do I want to skip this? Yeah, I'll skip this. So let's get back into the, the water data problem, the water level data problem. So once again, you've got these eight clock angles. And what we did was we said, well, all right, it's, it's reasonable that if you take a look at 11 o'clock and 5 o'clock, right, it, we're going to assume that those two measurements are identically distributed for everybody. And the reason is because, you know, they, they look pretty similar. It's just a question of where the top of the, I don't know. That might not be a reasonable assumption, and it's not necessary. But we were, we were trying to illustrate this blocking thing that you can do. You, you, can, you can pair these up in, in whatever way you want. That was what the last slide was about. And in the extreme case, you might imagine that all eight of the measurements are identically distributed. Remember, we have to assume that they're independent, conditional on the, on the component, right? That's, that's given. But what about the distributions themselves? They don't have to be the same. But some of them might be. And so we're going to assume that 11 and 5 are the same, 4 and 10 are the same, 2 and 8, 7 and 1. Those are going to be assumed to be the same. And so in reality, we really just have four densities that we need to estimate. And the algorithm looks very much the same as it did before. Here's the, the regular z hat. Here's the regular uh, update of the lambda vector. This is simply a kernel density estimator, so there's not very much that's interesting here. By the way, this is done for each, so, so fj is the vector of densities, right? It's not really the vector, excuse me, it's not, it's the product of its marginals, right? fj is the product of its marginals, and so we can talk about the kth of those marginals, right? So we're, we're dealing here with the kth marginal density of the jth component. And this is what we get when we try three components. Um, and, and this is just a fun slide to talk about. <laughs> OK, so, so what's going on here is we, we assume that there are three components. And what you have to remember is if you see red in this plot, it's the same people that are in red in all of the other plots, right? Because these are eight dimensional observations. We've reduced that to four dimensions by pairing up those two, you know, the, the, the 11 and the 5 and so on, right? And so what we're looking at is kernel density estimates of the response patterns of individuals who fall into each of the three components that we have posited. And so you can see, well, remember, zero is the correct answer, right? So, so the, the red group of which I guess we see about half the individuals, in which I guess we see about half the individuals, knows what it's doing. The reds, the reds seem to know what's going on. Um, the blues are very interesting, right? So that comes out to be 7%. You, you think about this, it totally makes sense, right? So the blues seem to say minus 30 over here. They say minus 60 over here. Over here they say 30, and over here they say 60. Right? Well, you think about it. What would, what, would, what would 60 degrees to the horizontal look like? Well, it looks like this, right? So, so this, this blue group is the group that draws the water parallel to the sides of the, of the vessel, which is interesting. <laughs> then, there's, then there's the green group, which is kind of in the middle. So what's, what's kind of cool here is the, the green group seems to know what they're doing 
when the, the vessel is nearly uh, vertical, right? So here and here, the green group seems okay, but as soon as you start to tip the vessel a little bit more, the green group is a little confused. They, they think maybe the water should be tilting a little bit with the vessel or something. Uh, anyway, it's just a fun story to tell. You can also try this with four components. And again, it, the, the beauty of the theory due to this, this 2009 paper is this is key to be identifiable. Right? So you know that running this algorithm with however many components you want is something sensible. Right? You, you're, you're actually estimating something that makes sense. And so, let's see, you still have the red group that knows what they're doing. You still have the green group that's kind of the same interpretation. I think I mixed up the colors here. Uh, the, the, now this light blue group is the one that puts the water perpendicular or parallel to the sides. And then there's the, the dark blue group that's, more, I don't know, it looks like they almost are just guessing. They're, they're almost like a uniform distribution down there. I don't know what the blue group is doing, but they don't seem to have any idea what they're up to. Uh, Hoban Thomas, the, the psychologist, found that interesting because he, was, he had the theory that, that people are actually grouped into discrete groups. There's kind of a debate, according to Hoban, in the psychological community about whether there is an entire continuum of individuals or whether the individuals actually cluster like this. Right? So this was a, a, a way that we could try to get at what those clusters might look like. I actually haven't talked to Hoban to find out how, how that debate is coming along. I don't know what he's where he is on that. But at any rate, uh, what I'm going to do now is actually getting to the title of the talk and talk about smoothing maximum likelihood. This will be a change in the algorithm that we use, and I'll tell you a little bit about why that is. So after we have this algorithm, right, that seems to, to be producing useful estimates. It seems to be doing something sensible. You start to ask the usual questions that a statistician would ask. Right? Is there any sort of a, an objective function that this algorithm is maximizing? And, and if so, maybe that will help us to answer questions like whether it uh, is consistent. Right? Do we have any sort of asymptotic properties of these estimators that come out of this algorithm? It seems like we'd have to at least tie those questions to some underlying objective function, some sort of uh, maybe a log likelihood, maybe something not likely, but it's something, something that behaves a little bit like a likelihood. Is there, is there some sense in which this actually is an EM algorithm? In other words, we're, we're basing our algorithm on the EM framework, but there's no clear ascent property going on. So one of the nice things, in case you're not familiar with EMs, about EMs is that they have what's called an ascent property. It is an iterative algorithm, always, the EM algorithm. And at every iteration, the log likelihood increases in value. Right? That's, that's the, the, the major result from the 1977 paper that introduced the term EM to the world. So is there something similar in this particular case? Well, okay, so we might consider trying to look at this. S suppose we try defining a log likelihood, right? We'll call this script L, and if, of course it's a function of the parameters, which are lambda, a vector, and f, a vector of densities. And so this is, I guess, what the, the likelihood would look like. Um, and it turns out that there isn't an ascent property. Um, in fact, this is Didier who, who first showed this. He's like, no, this, you can actually just check it numerically, right? All you need is one counterexample, and you know that it's false. So, so he found a counterexample. This, this does not increase monotonically according to the algorithm that I just defined. And that's a little bit disturbing uh, because it means that it might be harder for us to get at these kinds of questions, which are the questions that we really find interesting. All right, so got no, no ascent property for this, but what we're going to do is uh, borrow an idea due to Egermann and Lariccia. This is a, a 1995 Annals of Statistics paper. And the, the Egermann and Lariccia paper uh, is, is one in which you see this script N appearing. The script N is very similar to another algorithm that was uh, in the literature, the EMS algorithm that predated this one. So if you know what the EMS algorithm was, uh, this is 
Bernard Silverman, uh, gosh, who else was on that paper? Silverman and Doug Nitschke, I can't remember who else was, but anyway, the EMS algorithm was uh, typically used to do image processing. It's an EM algorithm for image processing. And what they did was they smoothed the, the likelihood. Well, the problem with EMS was that its theoretical properties were not well understood. And so these guys came along and did a modification of the smooth using this N operator. And it turns out when you use the, this N version of the smoothing, you actually get some theoretical properties that you can prove. And so uh, one of my co-authors found this and said, oh, great, so maybe we can try this. Right? And this is what the N operator looks like. And this is nothing, I should have put this on the slide, I guess I did not. This thing right here is, is nothing but a, a kernel density, right? So, so it's an R-dimensional, well, actually, yeah, this is, this is R-dimensional. Remember, this, this integral is in R-dimensions. And we typically will just use something simple. So this case of R will be the product of its marginals. And each marginal would be something like a normal distribution with a particular mean and variance, right? So, so this is nothing but a kernel density, sorry, a, a, well, it is a kernel density that has a bandwidth H, okay? So this is, if you do any kernel density estimation, this would look familiar. And so what's being done here is instead of a typical convolution where you might have kernel density integrated against just Fj, we're actually integrating it against log of Fj and then exponentiating at the end, right? So if you, if you take away the exp and take away the log, now you're doing what the EMS algorithm did originally, the Silverman et al. algorithm, right? And so the, the innovation of Egermann and Lariccio, which actually improves the mathematics quite a bit, is to add, is to do the, the smoothing on the log of the density and then exponentiate at the end. And it turns out that this, this function is, is quite neat. It has lots of nice properties, um, concavity, for instance. So we can talk a little bit about what we're trying to accomplish here. This is, this is now the new, smooth version of the log likelihood that we're going to try to maximize, we hope. Right? And, and just to get a, a, an intuition for what's going on here, you can kind of look at the infinite sample case, right, where, where you, you suppose you actually have infinitely many draws from the G distribution here. This, this G density is the mixture, is the mixture density. Right? So, so this is what we're essentially looking at. Now, I've done something a little bit funny here. I've, I've renamed lambda times f, right, as e, okay? And I've brought that out here, and th that's kind of funny. Well, suddenly e is no longer a density. That's okay. And in fact, this is, this is a kind of a, a slick trick due to um, one of my graduate students, Xiao Tian, who, who noticed that you could do this, and it actually helps in many ways, not least because now you don't have two parameters, you only have one. We've, we've come across several difficulties due to the fact that we have to deal with a, a Euclidean parameter, lambda, and then a functional parameter, f. And it, it looks like this, this, this simple trick makes a lot of those problems go away, which is amazing that we didn't stumble across it before now. So, so this is going to be how we define this so-called um, infinite sample log likelihood. We're going to try to Sorry, this is, not a, this is not a log likelihood. This is sort of like the negative of a log likelihood, right? Because the, this thing right here is kind of playing the part of the likelihood, but it's in the denominator of a log, right? So there's a negative sign in front of it. So, so now what we're going to try to do is minimize this function, which is a function of E, vector E, right? Which is E1 through E M. All right, so it turns out that this extra term is, is kind of neat, and this is a trick that comes from uh, a paper of, of Silverman's as well. You, you throwing in this term is what you do to ensure that the solution of this minimization problem actually integrates to one. And so that's very cool. So, so that makes this happen, which is what we want, right? Because we really want these f's to be densities. We really want the lambdas to add to 1. And by throwing this thing in there, it turns out that you guarantee that the minimizer of this function will have this property. So that's nice. And so you stare at this, and you say, well, that looks very much like kolbeck leibler divergence. And so you can envision what we're trying to do here is minimizing a kolbeck leibler divergence. Now, it, it's not quite kolbeck leibler divergence because this thing here is not actually a density. Right? So if you want the kolbeck leibler divergence between G and this thing, you actually have to throw in a correction term. You have to subtract off the integral of this thing. 
okay? And so if you, if you sort of subtract off the integral of this thing, then you come out here with what we consider a penalty term. And, it, and it's kind of a penalization on how far your E's are away from their smoothed versions, which makes intuitive sense. Right? So, so you can view what we're doing is some, some sort of a penalized kolbeck leibler divergence minimization problem. Well, how does it work? Well, the, the good news is it's very easy to implement, at least in, in principle. Here's the old... Uh, algorithm, right? So we had the old E step, here's the old M step, and then there's the KDE step. Well, how does this change when you throw in this smoothing? This is how it changes, right? The only thing you do is you have to have to take the smoothing into account in your E step, right? Now, it turns out this is not really an expectation anymore, right? So it's technically it's not an E step any longer. Um, it is what I would call an M step, and the M here is for minorization. So, so we we'll call this an MM algorithm, not an EM algorithm. I'll tell you a little bit about e MM algorithms here. Maybe. There we go. So, so the first M is for minorization. What does minorization mean? Well, we'll define it here. So this is, this is now the finite sample version of the lug likelihood that we're going to try to uh, maximize in this case. And it's, and it's the smoothed version of the lug likelihood. What we can do is define a second function, q. And q depends on actually four values, right? So, so you give it a, a lambda and an f that are the current iterates in your, in your algorithm. And then given those things, we have another function of lambda and f. This is just like an EM setup, right? So this looks very much like what happens in the E step of an EM algorithm. We will define this function like this. And we define it like this because we can prove this inequality here. This inequality is the minorizing inequality. Right? So what we say is that Q is a minorizer of this function here at the current iterate. And I'll show you what that means intuitively here. This is a picture. Right? So suppose that the top curve is, let's see, are we trying to, yes, we're trying to minimize here. Right? So, sorry, we're trying to maximize. That makes much more sense. We're trying to maximize the top curve. And to, and to do that, we need a minorizing function. Right? So, so here's the top curve, which is very difficult to deal with. This function right here, which we pull out of our hat because of what happened on the previous slide, right? that inequality that I showed you on the previous slide, which is right here, right? this inequality guarantees that this curve right here has two properties. This curve is bounded above by the function, the function that we care about, right? And it also is tangent at the current iterate. The, the values are equal. If you plug in lambda hat and f hat, very trivially you can see that this and this are equal to one another. And so the picture is right here, right? So the top curve is what we want to maximize. The bottom curve is the minorizing curve, which is touching at the current point, but everywhere below. And then you can just look at the picture and, and understand why an EM algorithm works. This is, by the way, the picture for an EM as well as an MM. MM is a generalization of EM. Right? So EM, EM algorithms work this way. You have a difficult function on top. You construct a minorizing function. And you can see by looking at the picture that if this is your current value where they're touching, any increase in the lower function will guarantee an increase in the upper function. Has to by construction, by the construction of this minorizing function, right? So, so all EM algorithms are really minorization maximization algorithms, or MM algorithms. It's just that in this particular case, we're constructing a minorizing function without using an expectation, right? So this is a slightly more general form of, of EM, if you will, right? So this is what we want. This is our ascent property. This is guaranteed now. We can prove this. And that's nice. Um, it's also nice that if we try this algorithm, right, I mean, it, it didn't look very different, and so if it produced very different results, that might be slightly alarming, uh, and it turns out that it doesn't. It's even hard to tell. It, the reason it's hard to tell what's going on here is because the dotted line is sort of hidden. Each of the colored lines is from the original plot, and for each colored line, there's a dotted line that more or less follows exactly the colored line. The dotted lines are the new algorithm, and the colored lines are the original algorithm. This is the sort of behavior we see in all of the examples that we have looked at. 
And so the good news is that empirically, at least, there doesn't seem to be very much difference between the, the algorithm that sort of intuitively makes sense and the algorithm that has this nice new theoretically provable property that it has an ascent property. Okay. And so this is still ongoing work. What we'd, <laughs> I'd love to have been able to stand up here to tell you, yes, we have a consistency result, or we know what the, rate of convergence is, the rates of convergence are. Um, we thought we had a consistency result, but then, then uh, Xiaotian, my grad student, found a mistake in, in one of our proofs. So, so we almost had a consistency result, but that's, that's where we're going with this. It, it turns out that we can't quite... Uh, steal the ideas of Egermont and Lerichia. We, we've tried very hard. It's, it's actually a very interesting paper and yet a difficult paper to read. Um, if, if Laurent and, and Didier are in the audience, they, they know this is true. And, and so we can't quite use the same ideas, um, but they have some, some nice leads that we're trying to follow up. At least these empirical results suggest that we have consistent estimation. Uh, this, is, this is a plot that I stole from the 2009 paper that, uh, that I wrote with Didier and a, another graduate student. And it, it, what you're looking at here is the logarithm of the sample size. This is the logarithm of the square root of mean integrated squared error for the parameter F21. Remember, F21 is the density function for the second component, the first coordinate, right? And, and so, you know, you see this log-log plot lining up along a straight line. The slope is pretty close to minus two-fifths. Minus two-fifths is what you would expect if you were using an optimal bandwidth in a, just a regular old kernel density estimation problem. So this is at least very suggestive that we have nice rates of convergence that seem to conform to the non-mixture results, um, but we don't know yet. That's, that's where we're trying to head with all of this, and with any luck, we'll, we'll be able to report on some, some interesting breakthroughs the next time you have to suffer through all of these slides. Thank you very much. Merci, Dave, pour cet exposé. Y a-t-il des questions? Uh, first of all, uh, thanks a lot for this nice talk. Uh, because uh, it was only a few words at the very end about optimal bandwidths, I wonder, uh, because the method is, uh, consists of uh, a lot of building blocks, if uh, there is any empirical evidence that the choice of bandwidth, especially for multivariate case, because I had seen that you used uh, kind of isotropic bandwidths, uh, the same in, in each direction, if it uh, affects uh, the numerical performance and analysis, or here, because of a lot of building blocks, it's not so that important uh, the bandwidth choice. Yeah, that's, that's a... No, uh, smoothness of assumptions. On <laughs> right, it, it, that's a very good question. We, the, the question involves um, choice of bandwidth, and I think the, the observation that there's nothing that keeps us from using different bandwidths for the different components, right? We could, I, I had a, a single H, and it was like an H to the rth power, but there's no reason that I couldn't have a different H for each of the components, each of the coordinates within each component, in fact. Uh, and we've, we've done some exploration of that. In fact, we have a manuscript that's under review right now where we talk a little bit about different bandwidths for different components and, and, and different coordinates. Um, and I think that you're absolutely right. That, that's kind of an open question. The selection of the bandwidth is something that we're using very simple rules right now to accomplish. Uh, we make it slightly more complicated by looking within each component and each coordinate, but it's still kind of the, you know, just sort of the standard, what is it, like Scott? Um, you know, the, I can't remember what, exactly what the rule of thumb is for choosing a bandwidth, but that's all we're doing right now. Um, th th good question, open question. As a comment, I wanted to use 10 years later, only one component instead of H. So, so the suggestion is to use nearest neighbor in each component? No, no, nearest neighbor for multivariate For the multivariate, instead of, instead of each component individually. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I, the reason that we are looking at each component individually, of course, is because of the assumption of conditional independence that we make. Um, but I think you're right that it's, the, the two things are really separate. Right? Conditional independence leads us to think in terms of each marginal separately. But we don't have to do that when we're doing the, the kernel density estimator or any of the other parts. Right? The, 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 um, 
The conditional independence is merely to give us identifiability of parameters. And we haven't explored different types of estimators, so that's a very good suggestion. It turns out that none of us was an expert on uh, density estimation when we started this project, so we just kind of picked the, the easiest one off the shelf, and so nearest neighbor might, might work as far as I know. Yeah. Une dernière question. Well, thank you, David, for this uh, wonderful lecture, actually. It uh, opened my eyes on the subject. <laughs> I've got an aside question. In many of the uh, psychometric, uh, psychological experiments, there's a, of this type, there's a gender effect. Do you recall if there's any gender effect? Wow. Yes, there is. And I'll tell you, Hoban Thomas, my colleague, got into a lot of trouble simply for publicizing the gender effect that he had observed during the... I think it was the water level. It might have been a different... No, I think it was water level. He has, he has one example of a story where it turned out that women scored significantly worse on a particular task, according to his data. And wow, he, he caught a lot of heat for that. Um, so, so yes, is the simple answer to your question. Je propose de remercier encore une fois David.